Hello, 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 everyone. This is Chris Ferguson. I'm your host of You've Championed Yourself. Who are you? I'm so excited for the guest that I have today. She's uh, somebody I look up to. She's somebody I respect deeply. And she is somebody that just has a way with words. And so my guest today is Karen Langford, and she's an inspirational speaker. She is amazing in what she does, and but she's all about service. And that just is what I showcase here on You Championed Yourself, Who Are You, is people who are ordinary people who have taken their dreams and their ideas and turned it into their reality. As they reach beyond their personal struggles, their pains, their traumas, so many people lose hope and give up. There's a few who can walk through their obstacles and challenges, not knowing where it's going to take them. They trust themselves enough not to give up, to do the follow through in their personal life, in their career and in their relationships. Those are people I consider champions. So we'd like to welcome Karen here today. Hello, hello, hello. How are you? Hi, fine. Thank you for the lovely, lovely introduction. That was so sweet of you. Well, I, I I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I'm very authentic and very real. And I just love the fact that we have a lot of things in common on different levels, different ways, but they're all the same levels. So with that, I, I was just like, oh, I've got to ask her. I've not asked anybody else um, from that group so far to come and talk and because it is video and audio very few people do that mm -hmm. and very few people want to be more they want to be more invisible so i appreciate mm -hmm. that well so today you i can talk about anything but i want to talk about your dancing you were a professional dancer i was a amateur dancer doing professional dancing does that make uh, sense yes it does so you were a professional dancer yeah, yeah. <laughs> unpaid let's put it that way <laughs> okay. well usually a lot of a lot of places will will accept those people who want to dance and learn to dance and love to dance to dance and let them volunteer so i get it but mm -hmm. it was it seems to be a passion of yours of something that you did at a time in your life can you talk about that well, I've danced all my life. And ever since I was young, I used to dance on stage in shows that we did in this little tiny town called Loudonville, Ohio. And we put on a variety show every year. So I would dance on that. And then going out and dancing with my friends is something I've always done. And then when I lived in Nashville, I was a regular dancer on the Wild Horse TV dance show for several years. And I would dance several hours a night, several nights a week. And then I also danced on some music videos. So that's a little, that's, I would consider that a professional dancer, even if you volunteered for it, you know, I, mm -hmm. I consider that professional because I couldn't get up on a stage and dance. There's no mm -hmm. way I would be left to left foot and it would be, it would be a nightmare. So mm -hmm. I, I, I honor that in you because I've always loved dancing but ever since disco went away, I've just been lost. <laughs> so I, moving and then just bless whatever comes out. <laughs> There's the problem. That's that's exactly the problem. But you're an inspirational speaker. And what motivated you to become that or to do that? Good question. Pretty much all my life, I wanted to be an actress. That was my biggest dream. And I had a, a, a few t bits of taste of it back out in California and then in Nashville. But then in 1979, I ended up having a breakdown. Mm -hmm. And it took me a couple of years to get through it. I really miss the entertainment business and wish I could have gone back to it. But that was just kind of out of the question. So I thought, how can I take performing to a different level? Because I learned so much through that breakdown and everything that I went through, you know, going through it. So I decided, I wonder if I can become a speaker and I could still be performing only now I would be performing with a message. And that's sort of how, you know, how that got going there. I love that. But what was your message? What was the, What was your passion at that time to start speaking? Learning to love and accept yourself as you are. So many people hold all their feelings in. And I'll tell you, if you hold your feelings in, 
it will either manifest as a mental or physical illness. And for me, it, it manifested as a mental illness. Mm. So it's really so very important for us to learn to love and accept ourselves as we are. And as women, we know that it's stacked against us, against us right from the beginning because we're told we have to work a certain way. We have to act a certain way. We have to be a uh, size minus 10. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we, wear. We, we can't have any wrinkles. You know, we have to look like we're 15 forever. So we get hit from that right from the beginning. And my message mainly is just to teach people that we have got to learn to love and accept ourselves as we are. And that's tough. That's really tough to do. Even for me to this day, I still struggle with it. Really? I, um, I think, you know, I grew up in an orphanage and so I was nonverbal. They did, they thought I was literally at the term at that time was retarded or mm -hmm. deaf or mute, but I wasn't, I was in so much anger that I just held my, my, my words because I was just angry in life. Mm -hmm. And so as a woman, finding my voice was one of the hardest things. And of course, I picked law enforcement to get into. And you can't have a voice in law enforcement, not in corrections, not in dispatching, not working with gangs, not working with high schoolers. You know, you can't have it. So now that I've retired, it's like, I have a voice. I'm going to speak out. Everything that I couldn't say before, I'm doing now. And I love the fact that you identified, and this is something that really resonates with me, is how much women are actually pushed down, mm -hmm. no matter what their education is. Because in, in seeing this in law enforcement, I saw this quite often. I had a bachelor's degree. I had a certificate in criminal profiling. I had a certificate in hostage negotiation and had more training than a male counterpart. And when I started the same position he started a year before, they wanted to pay me $3,000 a month, a year less. And I, I was very aggravated because I had more experience and more knowledge, but because he's a male, he was getting, going to get paid more, even though my degree was higher and in administration and had all these other certificates, it was really bad. So I, yes, I do um, try to work as much with women who have those issues, who can't speak for themselves to speak up and to be that, that voice for them in the world, because it's not about taking on life in the same ways that men do it with aggression and violence. It's all about communication. It's all about speaking. It's allowing people to understand love from a nonviolent understanding. And so when you, when you tapped on that, all this just came up in me. I was just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Again, it seems like we're, we're connected at the hip and we didn't even know it. We have mutual friends, but we did, we didn't even know it. So um, with that, it's, I love the fact that you see it and you recognize it and you're okay talking about it because I like people who are like-minded and who want to go out and speak on things to help others. Yeah. One of the things. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, so I don't know what else. I was going to ask you, have you gone out and spoken at different places on behalf of this? I've spoken quite a I can't say quite a bit compared to a professional speaker, but for me, I've spoken quite a bit. And usually it's in some more forward new thought churches. I've spoken a lot in that. Um, I've spoken at the high school, at the college, you know, in some other places. But one thing I... I like to point out is a lot of this, especially when it comes to women and men, is cultural because yeah. right from especially yours and my generations and those behind us, this is what we were taught. Men always led, men always had the final say. Women couldn't speak. We couldn't speak out. We had to sort of like they used to say when you were children, women should be seen and not not heard. Yeah. And and so the, the culture needs to change. And we saw it at the beginning, let's say the Me Too movement, even though it's been coming for a long time, you know, with the woman's right to vote. And women are starting to find their power. But we've come a long way. We still have a long way to go. And the other day I put some ads that used to be on, you know, newspapers and the TV and everything way back from the 40s and 50s, mm -hmm. where the idea that a woman's life is just so wonderful if she gets a vacuum 
as a president. <laughs> and his dad said, you know, your wife is wonderful because she takes care of you. She does the dishes. She does the laundry. She takes care of the children. And that was the culture. And especially when it comes to sexual harassment, it it was accepted that it was okay for men to do that. And now we expect men to just change like that, but they're trying to bring their whole upbringing and catch it up with today's day and age with women wanting to be equals. And it's hard for them. We've got to cut them a little bit of slack. As long as they're trying to tra change, mm -hmm. I will give them every benefit of the doubt. Now, those that don't want to change, then... It's a whole yeah. nother day. Yeah. Well, see, I just posted, literally just posted a couple of days ago that as women, I teach women in self-defense. Mm -hmm. So I teach him to, you know, when you, when you're outside walking, keep your keys between your hands because it's a weapon. Carry pepper spray. Uh, don't walk outside at night unless you're in a group of people because it b makes you a target. It makes you high risk. And then it was like, no, we, it's not about us having to defend ourselves on their level. It's about them changing their mentality mm -hmm. and not assaulting women. And so I literally just posted that just the other day on my personal Facebook page and my other Facebook pages, because it is about making everybody equal. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I, I wasn't real fond of the 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 sixties. I wasn't just a kid. I was at ten years old in sixty nine when the women started burning their bras and the the wow. feminism was coming out and stuff. And I thought, gosh, why do they have to burn their bras to be an individual? Why do they have to burn their bras? I didn't know better. I didn't have any mm -hmm. understanding. And why did they have to do this or make this statement publicly? Because I didn't know what the history was. Mm -hmm. I was too young. As far as the Me Too movement, I. I get it. It exists. Sexual assault happens. I get it that women should be able to wear whatever they want. It does. It shouldn't make them a victim. But I'm wondering how many I've had to defend boys on false rape charges from girls mm -hmm. in a high school because they wanted that they wanted them as their boyfriends. And so the tides kind of turned a while ago and somehow People would rather lie than just be honest and say, hey, listen, they don't like me for who I am. And, and I accept that. So I have to find somebody who does like me. Mm -hmm. And so in do and having to do that. So I see both sides of the coin. But mm -hmm. as far as labels, it's just like the cancel country, cancel culture. I don't need any more labels in my life. You can, <laughs> call me, you can call me whatever you want. You can try to cancel me. What? How do you cancel somebody in the cancel culture? I asked this of, of all my guests and they, every one of them was like, I have no idea. If you there's don't know, go ahead. There's a difference though, between cancel and consequence. And Absolutely. I always like to make that distinction because if somebody's out there doing something really bad and they lose their jobs, that's not necessarily being canceled. That's the consequences of their actions. Mm -hmm. Right. So now there are people that have done things 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, and they've changed since then. Mm -hmm. But people will find that out about them and hold that against them and then cancel them because uh, they've already learned from that a long time ago. They've changed their thinking. They've changed their beliefs. It was a mistake. Mm -hmm. It's what they did, you know, back then. That's mm -hmm. when I will give people a pass unless, you know, they, they committed some big crime. They still need to be held accountable. But that's where I kind of distinguish between cancel and consequence. So What I've been seeing is the cancel. If they don't like what you say or don't like your opinion, they cancel you at that point. And I'm thinking, how can you cancel me? Everybody has an opinion. Mm hmm. So I don't, I don't get it. But then I'm, I'm of the advanced stage that's saying there's a lot I don't get anymore. And that's okay because I'm not supposed to, because that's not what is resonating with me. But I've worked with kids for 21 out of my 40 years of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And so they kept me young and I still have a lot of them on my Facebook page, but they laugh at me because it's like, They'll say, oh, but you're being canceled. It's like, you can't cancel them. They're a human being. The only way they can be canceled is if, the, if they die. And then, then that's a whole nother story. We need a funeral. And then just start laughing because they, they know I don't understand it. Yeah. Well, there's also that difference that you just pointed out in canceling somebody just because you don't like what they say. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one thing. 
But if somebody's doing something wrong and they need to face the consequences, then that's another thing. So that that's where I do the st- distinction. But just because somebody does something you don't like or believe in and you say, well, I'm not going to like them anymore. I'm throwing out all their records or, you know, whatever. Then that uh, that is sort of a, a form of cancel. So I understand what you're saying. Um. You do writing. You're a blogger. And I love that. What got you into blogging? I started about, let's see, 2008, just when computers started to get really popular for mainstream society. And I was living up on the mountain, on Bonaire Mountain, between Sparta and Crossville. I don't know what got me started. I've always loved to write ever since I was a child. I used to write when we did snail mail, these really long letters <laughs> to my friends and everything, my grandmother would say, <laughs> I'd get this really long letter from her. She'd, you know, write back a real quick one. And then I'd write back another one. She was right back where she started from and having to write again. But I've just always loved to write. At first, I just started writing my thoughts and my beliefs and everything. And then after I started writing for the Cookville Herald Citizen newspaper in 2010, then and some other magazines also then i started putting those articles on so right now it's pretty much just the articles i've written for newspapers and magazines and newsletters that i put on my blog well i i love that because i have been a writer all my life i used to write poetry when i was younger and one of the first poems that uh, i wrote back in the 80s now i'm dating myself um were cops are people too and I didn't know how much it was going to mean a whole new meaning nowadays. It was published out in the Wyoming Law Enforcement mag- Monthly Magazine. Mm-hmm. And I was thrilled. I was They accepted my, my poetry and thought it was amazing. And since then, um, I've been, I wrote a children's book on bullying. And it usually starts in the family. And in writing, have you written a book? I am on my 11th or 12th edit okay. of my spiritual novel. So um, okay. I have to do one more read through and then I've got to just bless it and let it go and get it published. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, you know, you can do it through Amazon yourself. That's where I'm going to do it first. Okay, good. Because yeah, when you do, hard. huh? when you do, I want you to come back on my podcast and we can do a whole big spill on it about how it's coming out and where to get it oh, and the whole nine yards and the name. I'd love to. I'd love to. So um, fortunately for me, I did the Kindle also. And the book is called You uh, Leave My Bubbles Alone. <laughs> and it talks about young kids being bullied by family members and their friends or their cousins sees them and see them being bullied. And then they start bullying because the family doesn't stop it. Mm-hmm. So then when friends are over from school, they see you be calling those family nicknames that nobody knows about. And then all of a sudden, nothing's said, and they start calling you those embarrassing names at school. Yeah. And then it it's like that slippery slope of, of downhill craziness. And then I have been in, in three other books, and it's Business Life in the Universe. It's a comp- compilation book of 42 artists, and I'm going to be in volume five here mm-hmm. later this year. So my, my question to you is, if I can help you in any way, let me know. Okay, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Because this time, this time writing about is how did I get to be the manifestation specialist? (laughs) So it's going to take on a different term. But the fact is, is as you write, what emotions do you use? Are you using childhood memories? Are you using adulthood memories? For my book or for, Uh okay, this is going to really... When I first started writing this book, I wanted to start writing a spiritual self-help book. Okay. And I sat down and thinking, how am I going to do this? And then all of a sudden, the spiritual novel came out. And what surprised me even more is that, that it came through as a man's voice, this little girl's father. So it's the little girl's father talking about his daughter in their life and everything, because she's a special gifted little girl. And I just sat down and write. I had no plans on what was going to come next, who my characters were or anything. So to me, from a spiritual standpoint, it's like this little girl somewhere wanted to come through me and then write her message. So there's a lot of spiritual wisdom in it that Mm -hmm. did not necessarily come from me. 
that right. came through me. So as I'm writing, I'm thinking, darn, where'd that come from? You know, it would, it would surprise me what would come through. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've had friends read it uh, as a, as a, what do you call it? Beta readers. Mm -hmm. And to help me proof it. Cause I didn't want to pay to have to go through a professional editor. Right. And right. they would tell me how much it would touch them and give them the chills and stuff like that. So I keep thinking, and then the little girl's name is hope. So I keep mm -hmm. seeing all these words, hope, hope, hope all over the place. And they would just pop up at the most inopportune times. And I'm like, yes, universe, I got it. I'm working on it. <laughs> It'll get done, trust me, but <laughs> it's slow because I started it in 2015. Oh, wow. So I've been working on it for a while because I got, I was subbing at the time. And then I got a job for two years at the elementary school working with SPED kids. And mm -hmm. as you know, because you've had some experience, I love them dearly. I miss them terribly. But at the end of the day, I didn't want to do anything but just sit eat my dinner and then go to bed because I was so tired. So I had to put my book on hold. And right. then I ended up having to resign and retiring early to take care of my mom. And then after she passed away a month later, then I was able to get back on it a little bit. So it's just been a lot of love put into it. And we'll just have to see how it turns out and how people respond to it. I think it'll be fine. The reason why I asked you what feelings were, were you had, because I'm considered what they call hollow bones. And that's how I am extremely empathic, intuitive, mm -hmm. and that the messages I get are divinely guided and through, through spirit. And, and so it's not my words. And I could, 20 minutes after I have the conversation with you, I won't remember what was said while we were talking, but it's the words that are coming through. So before you came on here, I had this vision of hollow bones with you. And so that's why you confirmed what I felt before you, our interview started. So the fact was, is I thought, oh, I think she knows I'm empathic. I think she knows that I can channel. I think she knows that I do it a lot. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I was like, I couldn't tell anybody in law enforcement I did this. Yeah. I mean, I, I stepped out once and I had a vision and I sent it to the secret service and it changed the way that they started doing rallies. And since then, every time somebody from the federal government sees me, they know my face. It's like, it's posted somewhere. I think in the <laughs> post office or something, I don't know. But the fact was, is that it, it's the word is out that, you know, she said something, but the fact was, is I started getting stalked by people of non-good things. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how did they know about it? This is the only person I've ever sent it to, and I haven't talked to anybody about it. So this is interesting. So hmm, we'll have to work on that one. But that's how I, when you said that it was, you know, you didn't know how you wrote it. It just came through you. Now, you know, it's, it's called hollow bones and that's a wonderful place to be. Well, it, it's hard being an empath. I'm an empath with people and animals. And it's really hard concept to explain to people how you can feel what other people are feeling and know what they're feeling and what they're going through without them having to say anything. And I worked for a lady when I had a job in Sparta, and she was always in a happy-go-lucky mood and everything, never down or anything, or never showed it. But I always knew when something was off and I'd ask her about it. She'd go, well, how did you know about, how do you know I'm feeling that? <laughs> I was like, I just knew. And I could tell how animals are feeling. And mm -hmm. I used to have premonitions until a premonition said that somebody in my family was going to die. And then a cousin was killed. And mm -hmm. after that, I sort of shut it off because mm -hmm. it just shocked me so bad. I get things every once in a while. And right now I'm starting to have some, some issues with, my name being yelled out in the middle of the night, waking me up. And then I'm hearing a noise like a whoosh or feeling something on my bed, you know, or something like that. And I'm still trying to process all that to, to figure out what that all means too. Is it a woman's voice? It's been women and men's woman and men's. Because, well, the reason what I am picking up is that you have ancestors that want to talk to you, that want mm -hmm. to guide you. And it's like you're sometimes when your hair gets in your face and you brush it aside, 
It's mm -hmm. actually them touching your cheek and saying, hey, I'm with you. I love you. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you. But because of different experiences, you're apprehensive. It, it, it's a little scary. I'll wake up. I think, look, if you want to talk to me, just do it. You know, I'm ready. I'm willing to listen. And if you're going to show up in person, yes, you will probably have to peel me off the ceiling the first couple of times. But, you know, <laughs> I'm ready for it. But I do listen to that inner voice that we all have and that we all don't know we have. Mm -hmm. And so I do get those messages. But wake, being woken up in the middle of the night, somebody yelling my name and then hearing things in my room or feeling something on my bed, it can be a little discerning. The first few times it happened, I just, you know, laid there and shook. And now I'm used to it. So it doesn't it doesn't bother me. <laughs> but it's like, well, I'm talk, I'm just, you know, and, and I didn't turn it off. I didn't turn my my <laughs> mine off. And one day my husband and I were having a heated conversation, almost an argument. And he goes walking out of my office and I have crystals laying on a, on an altar here. And one of them jumped off the altar and went out the door after him. And he said, did you throw that at me? And I said, no, I'm sitting in front of my desk. I couldn't even do that. I said, did you knock it off there? The only other way it could come off of there is if you knocked it off. He said, I didn't touch it. And I said, well, I don't know what to tell you. He mm -hmm. says, I think we need to leave it here. <laughs> So he leaves, he comes back home and he says, he says, uh, honey, he says, it's got to be the energy. It's just got to be the frequencies and the energy. And he says, you're not going to do any carry knife throwing at me. And I said, well, I don't have any knives in my office, so you're safe. <laughs> <laughs> so it is all about frequencies and it. And I actually teach people about frequencies and how the planet is. And I think if you were to give me 15 minutes after this, we, I could explain it to you off of this, mm -hmm. what's mm -hmm. going on. But at the same token, I think they're not coming to see you. I think they're trying to get in touch with your dad. That could be because one night mom yelled really loud, Robert, you know, and woke me up. And I, I just like that. Well, what do you want me to do? <laughs> you can't just wake me up. You have to tell me something. But my dad, he, 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 he would not be open to any of that. No. Well, and I get it. I get it. That's why I said we could have that conversation away from here. But I think that's why, because you do hear and you do feel mm -hmm. that they know they can contact you, but they're trying to get to him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, after mom died, I was finding pennies everywhere. P mm. Pennies that you would never think. For instance, there was a cast iron baking dish that mom kept wanting me to look for. We couldn't find it anywhere. After she passed, I was cleaning out the garage and found it underneath a table in the garage with a penny in it. <laughs> I'm thinking that is just too much of a coincidence. Mm -hmm. We sold a lot of her purses and I had gone through all the purses and emptied everything out. And a friend and I thought we better go through them again. And she had helped take care of mom a couple of times. We found two pennies in one of the pockets, even though I know I've already cleaned them out. And it, it's just a lot of things like that where I was finding pennies where there's no way Penny should have been there. And that went on for maybe several months. It, I don't find them anymore. But once once in a while, I know I put my purse down on the floor one day and I look back down and there's a Penny sitting on top of the purse. So I, I know I have to believe that that was mom's way mm -hmm. of trying to keep in touch with me. Or just say, hi, I miss you. Yeah. It's my way of communicating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I just I just love the fact. So but with with everything that you've done in your life, how do you see your future? What do you want to do from here? What do you I know that you have? I mean, what do you want to do? I mean, because I know I'm in your corner to help right now. Number one, get through the pandemic safely and in good health for me and my dad. My dad's my dad and I. My dad's going to be 91 in January, uh -huh. so I have to take extra precautions. That's right. the first goal. Getting through the pandemic is the second goal. But during that time, I could be using that time to finish my book and, and get it published. As far as anything past that, I never make goals past you know, the next day, because every single time I have made any kind of goals, the universe would have another thing in plan and those goals would go out the window and I'd have to take this path. So I'm just riding on the path and seeing, you know, where it takes me. I love uh, it. 
I, lo I love that because a lot of people say, well, I do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this. And it's just like, it's refreshing that somebody finally gets it and just goes with the flow and allows. You, you have to go with the flow. I mean, if, if, it, if I had had my way, I would have been a famous, well-known actress. I would have been married, had 12 kids. I wanted 12 children. And I would, you know, be very wealthy where I could travel around the world. Well, then I had the breakdown and everything just kind of went mm, like mm -hmm. that. But that mm, was a great lesson for me. And I learned a lot from it. It taught me to have so much more love, compassion and understanding for what other people are going through. Mm -hmm. And that is a gift that not many people get. And I don't mean that in any arrogance, but if you look yeah. at what's going on in society and now the lack of compassion, the lack of kindness, the lack of oh, care. Speak it, sister, speak it. Now, but then it just seems like people have to learn that the hard way. And I learned it the hard way. So it, to me, I look back on it and it, it, it was a blessing. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I have been very fortunate in the people that I interview that I resonate with that come on because I respect and honor them all very highly. And I've met um, um, an individual I, I interviewed before you a couple of days ago, and he made some bad choices as a kid. He did time in a prison, a men's prison. When he heard that I used to work in a prison as a correctional officer I, at a men's prison, I knew and told him, I said, I know the life you lived. I understand most people don't get it. But the thing is, is he got out. He's changed his life. This man's worth $8 million now. He has a realty company and he's, he's just doing amazing things. So I'm hooking him up with people I know in his state so that he can speak to kids to show them there's no quick fix. Education's key. This man now has, has two PhDs, a master's, a bachelor's, and associates. So wow. the fact is, is yeah. So the fact he had somebody watching over him very, yeah. very much. So it's not about what you've done. I love that you said that in the past, it's not what you've done. If, if you've been held accountable for your consequences, then that's where it stops. You should be given the opportunity to redefine yourself as you so choose. Yeah. One thing I'd like to, to, to clarify from my belief, anyway, from my, my standpoint on it, because a lot of people will say everything's a decision. For instance, if you're an alcoholic, all that you have to do is decide not to drink. If you're a drug addict, all that you have to do is decide not to take another drug. People do not understand that particularly with addictions or things that have happened in our past, we can't just decide. Mm -hmm. there's no choice. choice right right because some people can do it some people can you know overcome those obstacles and become successful happy well-adjusted people other people can't do it and we've mm -hmm. got to stop judging them i saw somebody mm -hmm. post something the other day on facebook and it's a spiritual community about how everything is about our thoughts all that we have to do is think positive and choose not to do it anymore and I was like, I'm done with this group because <laughs> there's no compassion in that statement at all. We don't mm -hmm. know what is in somebody's subconscious mind. We don't know how damaged or traumatized they are. Mm -hmm. And it's like my breakdown. A lot of people would say, just snap out of it, get a job and you'll be okay. You can't do that, particularly no. with depression. An alcoholic, sure, you can be... I debated whether I even to, to, to mention this because I was thinking about things we might talk about, but, and I don't mean to offend any alcoholics that, you know, might be listening. This is just my thought. If, if you quit drinking and you're no longer drinking, then maybe don't call yourself an alcoholic anymore because when you think that you're constantly saying you're an alcoholic, mm -hmm. you're reaffirming that you might have that drink again. Yes. If you have that drink, fine, go back and, you know, say, yes, I'm an alcoholic. But in other words, you know, say I'm a former alcoholic, you know, or something like that, put it in the past. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you're ignoring it or anything. You still have to deal with it. You still have to avoid that drink. Another thing, when people have diseases and they're told it's in remission, I had a friend who just got over cancer and she said she was in remission. I suggested stop thinking about remission because if you think about remission, you're always going to be expecting it to come back. Yes. So you're healed. Then if something happens and you can deal with it then, but constantly say, I am healed. Thank you for my good health. So you, it comes back to those labels. Like you were talking yeah. earlier, we're constantly, constantly putting labels on everybody. I detest labels, any labels. I detest them. That's why I don't even use my Reverend doctor very much anymore. 
unless I'm speaking in a church or something like that, I'll use it or writing for a religious, you know, magazine or something like that. I don't even use those titles. I'm, I'm just me. And I want to be known just as me. And I think if we could get rid, I'll tell you one thing. I don't mean to to take. You're you're good. You're good. I love it. Some time ago, the idea came to me. If you were on an airplane, let's say either by yourself or with a group of people, that plane crashes and you all have amnesia. You can't remember who you were, what you were, anything. Who would you be? What political, what religion, what background? You wouldn't know. So you would just be who you are. Mm -hmm. So if we didn't have those labels, who would we be? Because those labels become our identity. Or or we allow ourselves to be defined by them. Mm -hmm. And by defined by others, too, who give us those. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But you see, this is, I guess I've always been that black sheep. I've always been that one that said, you know what, you can say whatever you want about me, but that's not me. You don't know who I am. You don't know what I'm about. I don't allow my past to define who I am and what I'm going to become. So I'm surely not going to listen to somebody I wouldn't give advice, get advice from. So the fact is, is I absolutely loved everything you said. And it is about labels and it is about that inner chatter. And it is a lack of compassion, a lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. And for me, what got me out of the organized religion was when I was eight and the Catholic church told my mother, she couldn't raise six kids by herself Mm -hmm. and then found an orphanage. And my mother dropped us all off and drove away. And so I couldn't fathom, I, there's no way I could do that with my child. And I always vowed that no matter what, um, I could, I came from, you know, the, the old touring coming so far beyond the tracks of, you know, and my, my heroes weren't the normal people. My father's Native American. He was a miserable alcoholic, but they don't have the enzymes or certain genes in their DNA to fight it off. So it makes them more susceptible to getting addicted to it. But just like Mm -hmm. smoking cigarettes, there's 4,000 chemicals that they put in the cigarettes to interact with your body to get you addicted to it. It's harder to get off cigarettes than it is cocaine. Well, I think of how hard it is for me to get off chocolate and sugar. Well, I've gotten okay. off the toilet in my life for a year. And if, if it's hard for me just to get off that, yeah. I can only imagine how hard it is for somebody to stop drinking or using drugs or, you know, not smoking mm-hmm. or, or whatever, you know, right. we, we're, we're just so judgmental. And as far as looking back on my life, I'm a lot of what you just said, I'm still working on. And because I've always been a really, really sensitive child. So Mm -hmm. you just look at me cross-eyed and I think, oh my gosh, why don't you like me type thing? Mm -hmm. So I'm still trying to learn. Who was it? Terry Cole Whitaker said one time, what other people think of me is none of my business. And I always try going back to that. But when you bring up religion, I was in an extremist religion that's popular in, you know, in our country and in the world. And it, it did a lot of harm. Mm-hmm. to me and you know my self-esteem because we're told you know you're sinners you're lower than a set and the sex has nothing to i'm trying to say lower than a snake's belly <laughs> lower than a snake's belly and it really beats down your your self-esteem mm-hmm. and your, your feelings of self-worth and then when i learned that there was a difference between being religious and being spiritual, mm-hmm. then I learned to get off the organized religious bandwagon. But then I got on the spiritual bandwagon and still believed what I believed was right and everybody else was wrong. And I felt that smir- spiritual smack on the back of my head. And I heard the word this is clearly, Karen, you can still be arrogant being spiritual. So knock it off. <laughs> oh, okay. So then you have to learn to have humility a lot of humility Uh, spiritual because if you're going to mm -hmm. follow all the great spiritual masters and their teachings about loving one another then you have to take that on for yourself and loving others but not just loving others but turning that on yourself too which is a lot harder than loving others sometimes it is i'm actually an advanced ho open open o practitioner i I love that I'm a Reiki, I'm a Reiki master, but I'm also have been a shamanic practitioner for 45 years. 
And so I go where I'm led. I don't practice Reiki, but I do do healings. I have mm -hmm. been very successful in healings. And some of it's been alcoholism. Some of it has um, been PTSD. Some of it has been cancer. It's just been a, a whole realm of things. But again, I had to be covert about it because of the career path I had. Mm -hmm. And so now it's just like, okay, I'm here. This is who I am. This is what I do. And I love the fact that I'm no longer invisible, not wow. as a woman and not as a spiritual practitioner and not as a healer. Yeah. And sometimes so have, this, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was, I was just, just saying, sometimes you have to find your tribe of like-minded people. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean that I'm in this tribe. So no other tribe counts. Right. But you have to find some people that will support you and love you and nurture you without having that constant barrage of, no, you're wrong because mm -hmm. you believe the way you do. I mm -hmm. always say, you know, Shirley MacLaine taught me to keep an open mind in all things. Mm -hmm. And that is probably one of the biggest lessons I've ever learned because I always say in the realm of everything there is to know, I really don't know anything. Mm -hmm. So I always keep an open mind. I have my beliefs of what I believe now for me, but I can't tell other people what they have to believe. Now, mm -hmm. if somebody's hurting somebody out there, then yes, we need to stand up to those injustices and, and stop them from hurting others. But, and, and I don't mean to, again, offend anybody, but we're coming into the holiday season where mm -hmm. a certain religion only wants their holidays and none others. And I'm thinking that's not what the masters taught. You know, mm -hmm. this should be a season of love and compassion and, you know, gift giving to people who don't have much and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But we, we just tend to forget those teachings of the spiritual masters. We do. We do. Absolutely. And, and like I said, that was the reasons why I turned to Native American shamanic practitioner mm -hmm. um, at 12 years of age. I was done. I was just done with it all. The hypocrisy, the double standards, the two tiers, just like on, a, on everything in life, there seems to be two tiers and it should be everybody's the same. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so when, when you see it as all the same, I'm actually reading a book where it's, they're talking about the Bible and when it was actually written and how it was changed from, they had a duality system. They believed in the gods and the goddesses, the male and the female. And all of a sudden, when things started to change, they all of a sudden started demonizing women and, and made them the problem like Eve in, in the Garden of Eden. There was no, the, you know, these stories were written anywhere from 700 to a thousand years after Moses walked the earth. And so the fact is, is okay, so... This whole belief system that people have is a fallacy. Mm -hmm. And if they just, and it doesn't matter what religion you're in or what sect, if you're in Buddhist, Muslim, Catholic, Christian, Ju Judeo, they all say the one thing the same way. Mm -hmm. The golden yeah. rule. It's how, how I treat other people is how I want to be treated. And that yeah, is the I golden rule. Yeah, I did my master's on the Bible, on how it was written, when it was written, why it was written, who it was written by. And I had some rude awakenings because I just believed, even though I've read it, I just believed what other people told me was, you know, what it said. And one of my biggest mind openers is that, you know, they say that mankind was made in God's image. But if you read the very first, it says, let us make mankind in our image. Yes. And who is us and who is our? But God nobody knows about that, mm -hmm. you know. And so when I went through it, like the nativity scene for Christmas, that story is not in the Bible. It, it wasn't in the Bible. It's something no. they put into it to appease people. Yeah. Well, even then, it's not. It, it's just a story that comes from um, Christmas. It the the actual story isn't even in the Bible. They took little bits and pieces, and there's no mention of a stable, no mention of animals. You know, no mention of kings standing around, you know, the, the cradle. It's just little bits and pieces that they got and kind of added to it. To make, It's a beautiful story. You sure. know, it's a beautiful story, but it, it didn't happen. And a but, lot of people didn't know that. But the way people use that book mm -hmm. as a judgmental 
artifact is what has gotten more people to say no more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's unfortunate. But I, I mean, in this book, I've, okay, I have to be honest. I'll tell myself, I'll tell myself, I've never read the Bible. I, after what I went through, I never trusted it mm -hmm. in my own heart. In fact, people were like, well, have you read the Bible? It's like, no, well, you should, you need to know the Bible. I was like, why? It's a story. It's somebody's written book. And there was other stories. I just felt it. There was other stories. Oh, there is. And so I was just like, this is, this is crazy. So Anyway, so I was judged for not reading the Bible. So I said, guess what? Have a nice day. When you get your understanding, you'll figure it out. No. Well, there's thousands of books that never ended up in the Bible. And, and um, a, a committee way back in biblical times decided what would be in it and all those other ones. So people say, well, if it's not in the Bible, then it's not true. Correct. But you have all those other writings from biblical times. So we just ignore them. And a lot of them contradict what is in today because people do not realize how often, well, you know, how often it's been edited and changed because we, they didn't have copy machines back then. So mm -hmm. we had scribes mm -hmm. having to copy and then they would miss copy and change words. And then they would think, well, I don't believe that. So let's change that. And they would change it a little bit. I respect it for what it is and that it, it has done a lot of good for people, but I don't respect it for people using it as, as a weapon of mass destruction. And I agree with that. And that's what it has been. Mm -hmm. And that was the concept back then in the day of to control people. And it's been that way since then, mm -hmm. which yeah. is sad, which is sad. Yeah. I so love this conversation. I found, I found my tribe. I bet. I bet. And, and so it's just, it's just so many people don't have that understanding. And so when they say, oh, you're one of them. Well, I married a devout Catholic. How, 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 how masochistic is that? <laughs> knowing my back, knowing my background, you know, but so the fact is, is it, it, he loves me for who I am and I love him for who he is. And we don't push either way, mm -hmm. but I, he's allowed me to give him healings. And so that's been, that's been an honor. That's been an yeah. absolute honor. So yeah, well, you say I don't know. If, I don't know if you remember. I used to live on an Indian reservation up in Ooh, British I Columbia. Yeah, um, it was a long time ago, but we still keep in touch. And that the movie Billy Jack started my path towards Native American spirituality, and I've really taken that on. I think if I had to choose any kind of religion, it would be the Native American spirituality and Hawaiian. I love Hawaiian. They're spiritual um, beliefs too. I'm actually, I'm actually doing. I went to my my spiritual conference that I went to was um, called the Action for Lumeria. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and so going to Shasta. Well, I'm in May in in uh, March, holding a Lumerian celebration from Maui and doing mm -hmm. a virtual event from it. And so it's, it's, it's exciting. And I'm just being guided to do this mm -hmm. and to clear the chakras of the planets. But because you have chakras, you have gatekeepers. And so you have to clear the gatekeeper first. So I'm having to clear the gatekeeper in Maui. And I didn't know there was a gatekeeper in Maui. I just picked that island of all the Hawaiian islands and found out there is a gatekeeper there. And so mm -hmm. in March on the spring equinox, We'll be doing ceremony and having speakers talk and it'll be virtual plus um, in person for anybody who's there or wants to come and enjoy it. So, yeah, so it is all about celebrating the divine feminine. Mm -hmm. It is all about reclaiming the earth and acknowledging that on this earth we have male and female, even though mm -hmm. they call her mother earth, we have male and female. The sun, even though they call him God, it's male and female. Mm -hmm. because without male or without female, you cannot give birth to anything. Yeah. And when people make that realization, of all of a sudden, you can't demonize women because it says it in the Bible. Or you can't put women down because Eve supposedly took an apple from it in the garden and, and, and Adam gave him her rib. If he took his rib off, he would, not, he would die. He just can't live without it. Well, there were two stories about Adam and Eve, one where they were made at the same time. And then the one where, you know, God supposedly took the rib out of, you know, Adam. his chest or whatever. Yeah. 
Yeah. So there are two stories and those are both in the Bible. Yes. And again, so there, there, you know, what, what do you believe? Because it's all been changed from what I'm reading now. Mm -hmm. And so it's just the history of the times and the anthropology and the different, different researchers that are doing it. That's the book I'm in right now. So it's, mm -hmm. it's been amazing. So it's kind of divinely guided that we had this conversation because it was validation for me that what I knew on a intuitive level was correct. But it's even more validating that somebody of your stature understands that it is just a book, too. Mm -hmm. And, and that, there are a lot of people that are coming to that realization, uh, especially those that are seeing all the harm that so many of them are doing in the name of their religion, in the name of their God. And they're saying that's not the way it's supposed to be. You know, right. then you was taught love then you Buddha taught love and you Muhammad taught love. And they're seeing all the contradictions. So that's why you're getting the nuns are growing, N-O-N-E-S. The nuns are growing, people that don't want anything to do with religion anymore. And it's the religion's own fault because of the way they're treating others. And, and it is, but it's also the programming indoctrination that they're doing. Mm -hmm. And they're not being honest. Because mm -hmm. once you see through the veil on one thing, you suspect everything. Once you lose that trust, it's gone. And that's the hardest thing to get back. So I agree with you wholeheartedly. And, and that's a shame because we have done a disservice to mankind and humanity as a whole by not being allowed to live in love, light and peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing that to to one thing I learned, though, is that they're doing what they think they're supposed to be doing based upon what others told them they should be doing. So. Yeah. We need to be careful about not judging them. They're where they need to be at this time in their life. Right. right. Some people will evolve to something else and some people won't. The, the greatest example is we're all going up the same mountain, but we're all taking big, you know, different paths, but we're all heading for the top. I, well, I, it's interesting that you bring that uh, idea up because I use a pyramid in my teaching and it's either you're the aggressor, or the oppressor, or you're in the victimhood, or you can climb to the peak and become your own champion. Mm -hmm. But they have to know that they can. Yes. That, that's the thing. They have to know that they can because their beliefs have been so put in a box and duct taped so tight that they, they don't know they can get out. So right. that's why I say we've always got to give people a chance to evolve because they're just doing what they believe they're supposed to believe. Yeah, but here's a lot of people are they take the Bible as word of gospel. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And 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 what they've been taught or or what their family has. And this is more generational and the generational traumas and the generational karma that follows them. And so it's really hard. I wrote a, a poem called Breaking the Chain to Abuse. And that's exactly somebody to help the family draw, stop the karma is to mm -hmm. break that chain. All it takes is one. All it mm -hmm. takes and breaks that karma chain and right. gives everybody after that a chance to be free-spirited and love and light. Right. So, and I was I was 13 when I wrote that. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of crazy. But yeah, I think I'm an old soul. And when I, I've had three near-death experiences in my life. And I think each one of those were at different stages. One was at four, one was at 15, and the other one was in 2012. Mm -hmm. And so it was those, those, the child, the maiden, and then the crone. Mm -hmm. So it was that evolution, but living through it was one of, I was like, how, why, what's my next step? Creator, tell me because you got to tell me what to do at this point because I shouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. Show me and lead me and guide me. Now, a lot of people don't get those gifts that, that you have unless they've had your de near death experiences. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a gift that's given to you because you see things that you can't, couldn't see if you hadn't gone through that. Right. For years, I was always angry and thought how bad my life was out at the home. And then as I became a teenager, I thought, oh, my gosh, what if they, my parents would have kept us? What, where would I be? 
And I felt grateful at that moment. Mm -hmm. Even as bad as it was, I was grateful at that moment because I was my own individual seeing the world through different eyes. Mm -hmm. So I think as, as we reflect back, we can't live in the past, but as we reflect back, those are the kind of messages that if we understand that there was a reason why, it may still may not be known to us, but mm -hmm. the reason why, but look at where we're at now and how we survived. Yeah. You and I are on that spiritual path with seekers. And mm -hmm. I remember Oprah Winfrey said to Sean Penn one time, asked him if he believed in God. And he said something so profound that that really touched me. He says, I'm okay with the mystery of it all. I thought, dang, what a way to <laughs> you have all the stress of trying to figure things out and seeking, you know, and being wise and this happening. He do, he's just okay with everything. And I thought, what a way to be. It but is. That, well, it okay. is because he's allowing. He's believing, but he's allowing and he's inspired by it. He does a lot of good in the world, too. He does. He gets a bad rap sometimes just because he was so impetuous when he was younger and did a lot of stupid things. And people don't want to see that he's changed. That's what we were talking about earlier. You mm -hmm. know, give people a chance to evolve. And what they did way in the past, unless it was some really horrible crime, you know, right. give them a break. They've evolved. They've changed their beliefs. Right. Some of us have to have learn the lessons the hard way to be able to evolve. And I get that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I understand the stumbles and the bricks and the obstacles and the challenges. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But when you can take your power back to you, it is the most invigorating, most liberating, most exciting thing that can happen in your life saying, I now have all the abilities of what I do. I can do anything that I want to do. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wish for everybody. Yeah. And that's what we have to teach people. Those of us that have become aware that we do have that power and that we can do that. We've got to teach those who don't think they can because right. they're not aware that they can, or they think they won't be able to handle it if they had that power. So they keep mm -hmm. pushing it away. So well, you know, every, everybody's intuitive. It's just how much you tune into yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody, everybody can heal themselves if they just get out of their own thinking and stop believing that somebody else is going to heal them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, again, it's, this is, I love, love, love this conversation. Karen, I'm so honored, so blessed that you're here today. Um, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, um, it's what Karen Langford or no Facebook is Karen dot I dot Langford. Um, Karen Lynn Langford. If they just okay. look, I, that's why I put my middle name in there. To okay. Make it and you're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn and your website. I'm going to have it posted on the video when it comes out and, and, and the audio. Um, but it's Karen Langford dot Weebly W E E B L Y dot com is her website. So I highly recommend you check her out, check out her blog. And let me see, let me see. It's um, make sure on everything guys, folks, HTTPS semicolon front slash front slash Karen Langford dot blogspot dot com. You have to put that HTTPS or some websites are not coming up. And this changed last year, just so everybody, so everybody knows. So if you get a go to put somebody's name in the toolbar of your of your email or the web address, and you don't put that HTTPS semicolon front slash front slash, it may not come up. And that's what Microsoft did and didn't tell anybody. Oh, okay. I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> yeah. See, I, I mean, the only reason why I know about it is because I have an IT husband. Okay, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. it. So. But in but in uh, um, in closing, I just wanted to say thank you for coming, thank you for sharing, and thanking for thank you for being you. I love well, that. Thank I'll you for having to the quarter. I had so, fun. Thank you. Hang on one second. It takes a special kind of individual to dream their thoughts and ideas and turn them into their reality. Karen has stepped past their, her fears stayed her course, and had the courage to follow through to the end. Karen, you've championed yourself. Now we know who you've become. Thank you for sharing your ideas, your thoughts, your dreams, and your being with us today.